drains and manhole covers are the essential impedimenta of civilized living. But are a nuisance in the garden because there they are, obtrusive, right near the front gate. But you can hide them with the prostrate conifers. They'll grow over this silver and green foliage, will grow in a dense carpet over that, still allowing access to the drains, which occasionally you need, and masking the hard aridity of the manhole cover and the surrounding walls with delicate greenery. And the corner itself, apart from the rhododendron, which is precox, flowering very early in the spring of the year. The corner itself is rather dead, and to draw it into the garden, you want bright, contrasting colors. And there are few plants brighter than the salvias. Brilliant. You, the colors are difficult to place. If you put those out in the center of the garden, you would immediately contract the garden boundaries because the colors are so bright, the eye goes straight to them. And as a contrast to the red, the silver. Glorious. And this will brighten the corner. The delicate pastel silver of the rose behind is exactly the right complement. And this corner will then be drawn and embodied in the garden proper, which is what we want. They're no good in pots. Yes, the sign of a good compost is the way the roots have developed into it. And those are marvelous. Not only do the salvias blend beautifully with the roses, but look at that against the green of the conifer. And a little silver to pick up the silver of the conifer. This will make quite a big bush. And if we get a mild winter, it will, of course, survive outside. Make the patterns random. You've got a, a very casual plant in rhododendron, a very informal plant in rhododendron precox. Again, the complement of foliage, the delicate green of young growth, which, whether there's flowers or not, make the garden beautiful. And I've got two plants left of the salvias. And these are a compact salvia, one that won't grow very much taller, but yet will continue to flower on side branches. That one, the roots are right through the bottom of the pot. Grant, if you're buying plants, if you've got to buy a plant, look for that. Knock one out of the pot. If the nurseryman's got any sense and is proud of his product, he won't mind. Don't. Take top growth as an example, a drawn, etiolated plant, no good at all. You want a short, jointed, stocky plant and a good root system. What's underground is more important than what's above it at this time of the year. And I will do myself an injury gardening one day. And two silvers, just as the final embellishment. May seem stupid putting one actually behind the tree, but it's only hidden from that part of the path. From here, you get the silver against the green. So don't ever take one viewpoint in a garden. Look at it from all sides. Pop over into your next door neighbors and see if he's getting any pleasure from your garden as well. And the leaven will spread and you'll find people will tidy their gardens up as yours tidy up. The neighborhood's a better place to live in when that happens. Because one thing gardeners are not, and that is selfish. I have been heart warmed on the allotment by the help and the way they share products and everything. And look at that corner. 10 peas worth of seed, 15 peas worth of effort. Now it's brilliant with color. And the final touch to the front of the house, I think a hanging basket just to take the bareness off the entrance and to add that little welcome. Flowers are the most welcoming things to a house. You get a house bedded in flowers, great. And making up a hanging basket is just the sort of job to reserve for a quiet late spring evening when it's warm enough to work outside and too early to go in to watch television.
And you line the basket. Make sure your supports are strong first. It's vital. Line the basket with sphagnum moss. And you can get hold of it fairly easy. This really isn't good quality, otherwise I'd bind it round the outer edges too, so there was no sign of the basket. But what I'm doing is making a well to stop the soil running through and to hold the moisture. And mix up the compost with a good strong peat base, because if you do go away on a fortnight's holiday, you don't want the plants drying out. And my old friends, the ivy leaf pelargoniums, to make a point of interest around the outer edge. And now I'm using the brilliant trumpet-like flowers of the petunia and the rest of the marigolds to fill in the basket and to mask the outer edge, lobelia, the trailing variety to give you that blue undertone to the more brilliant flowers above it. But before you put the basket out, keep it low down so you can water it and tidy it up and establish it. And then it's ready for going into its permanent position. And the final embellishment to take the last piece of nakedness off the front of the house, the hanging basket. And looking round at the tubs, you've got the satisfaction as the long evening light brings out all the colours of having done a pretty fair day's work, and the only thing left to do is to put up the hanging basket. And that finished off the patio garden. The next day, I started to reclaim a derelict border in the back garden of a friend's house. And the first thing I noticed about it was the high hedge at the back. Now, the roots from that are going to grow through and compete with anything I plant in the border for nutriment and moisture. I widened it by about 18 inches or so, and that'll make all the difference. The next thing is to see if there's anything already planted in the border that's worth keeping. Don't rush in and lift your sedums and hosters and strip the border bare. It's a fatal mistake. This shrub, which is stopping the volume of wind coming down between the house and hedge, immediately you put a hedge in a house like that, you create a wind tunnel. No plant that I know likes that. Human beings don't like drafts, plants don't like drafts, don't like being constantly teased by the wind. So you've got to leave that shrub there. Marvellous, a stop gap, and it gives you a background to paint the picture against. The acer will want moving forward a little bit because you've got one destroying the other. One of my favourite plants, the autumn flowering sedum. Now that will be a mass of red flowers. And if you've got children, you must have things that bring another sort of life into the garden. That will be a mass of butterflies. Because a garden isn't a thing just of shrubs and plants. It's a, a small, small microclimate, a small nature reserve. And it's all part of the interest. This is a wee bit too big, too tall for the scope of the border, it's going to dwarf the new flowering shrubs that are coming in. So that will be moved out into a corner by the greenhouse. It won't be wasted. The dahlias are expendable. The first frost will take care of those. So they can come out now. The liatris, which is a most unusual plant because the flowers open from the top down over. It's what I call an Australian plant. It does things in the reverse. That can stay because it's close enough to the front of the border. It's erect enough in habit to fit into the scheme. And this extra width, the extra 18 inches that we've taken off the lawn, hasn't spoilt the proportion. It's given us extra room to play with, but it hasn't destroyed what I call the essential balance of a garden. You've got a big, tall oak tree there. Now, this is a valuable tree in any garden because its roots go down instead of out along the soil surface. So you can plant right under that oak tree, provided you put something into the soil there to start them off. But it's all got to start here. It all starts with this stuff. That's what you've got to get ready. You've got to get it free of perennial weeds, of things like cooch grass. And you've got to put the manure in that's going to be the reservoir of moisture for the newly planted things. And then when they're all in, because you do get dry weather, <laughs> even in the British Isles you get dry weather, you put a mulch of rotted manure on top. And then with your soil in good heart, 
If you're looking after the roots, then surely the tops will look after themselves. And you don't get it done with talking. You get it done with a spade and a little bit of toil. Take your time about it. Have a cup of tea at regular intervals. Right down to the border edge, leaving a good clean edge, because remember, you've got a lawn to cut, you've got your edges to clip, and it's much easier to do it when you've got a clean edge to work from. And while the spade's handy, I'll move the things that don't fit the border. Like this hoster, for example, this doesn't suit my particular design, but it's worth keeping. So I'll take it out and plant it up in another part of the garden. Now to start lifting the plants in flower, like the delphiniums, for instance, but make sure you've got plenty of soil on the root. And the dahlias have to be lifted out of the way, but you've got a bonus with dahlias because once the tops have died down, you can store the tubers away in dry peat in a frost-free shed and use them next year. When you're lifting plants in flower like this, make sure they have a good root ball, and that way they stand at least a fighting chance of survival when you replant them again. The hard work's almost finished now. And if the work's done properly initially, you're off to a flying start. The pick of the things that are in there I've left, those are plants that were too good to risk moving out. They're going to fit into the sort of design that I've got for the border. We've straightened the edge, we've put a gentle curve that'll take it round the front of the house. The soil's dug, the manure's in. This is the vitally important thing. If you don't put the nutriment into the soil at this stage, you can't do it after, because once the shrubs are in, you don't dig it. And the competition from the hedges been lessened because when I dug the border, I cut the surface roots. Now, this doesn't harm the hedge. It doesn't even check it, but it gives the shrub roots that I'm planting a chance to establish. And I've picked the shrubs to give me interest the whole year round. Now, the great secret, as far as I'm concerned, with border design is to have contrasting shapes, as well as contrasting foliage, as well as contrasting flowers. And to do this, you must use herbaceous plants in contrast to your shrubs. In other words, if I've got a purple leaf berberis, which I have, I want to put something with delicate foliage in front of it, so the contrast and the complement are exact. It's no use thinking of well, the sedum in isolation, that is a beautiful plant as it stands there. But it'd be even prettier with a coloured foliage plant behind it. Something to lift it and to give you the interest throughout the year. So I'm going to use my shrubs, I'm going to use herbaceous plants to lift the contrast. And then I'm going to use the bulbs to get the impact in the spring. And then comes the exciting bit. And one of the great beauties of container grown plants of course you can plant at any time because the roots are confined you've got a good strong root ball you can even put them in in flower and the main vista down the garden is from the french window so nothing must be done to interfere with that because the first view of the garden is vitally important we're framing a picture, not detracting from it. 
So put it in position, and again, the beauty of container-grown plants is emphasized. You can stand it there. You don't have to dig a hole. And you can step back. And that is just edging the French window. And because the cherry is so very upright, we want something to contrast with that. And this really is one of my favorite conifers. The foliage is soft yellow in spring, and it's this lovely, vibrant green during the summer. And then in the winter, you get a dulling down like this. But the color's still there. Now, it will marry the terrace, the path, and the lawn into the garden. It'll soften the hard outlines of the stone. It'll grow possibly four feet across by three feet high in eight or nine years. And this is the great thing, to know precisely or within reasonable limits how big your shrubs are going to be. So back a little bit to give it a fighting chance to cover and soften into the path. And that should be fine. Oh, the Acer, I must move this because it really is being spoiled. Because if I leave it any longer tucked under this shrub, there's going to be nothing at all at the back. There's no branches. The shrub is one-sided now. And what I'd like to do is lift it and use it as a, an impact point as the border curves. You want to emphasize the curve, the line coming round by something some strong personality shrub, and plants are like people, have got personality. And <laughs> this is where the hard work, I thought it was finished. It starts over again. Be careful. Don't ever rush it gardening. You can do endless damage by carelessly ramming a spade in. Don't take more than you can lift. Take as much as you can lift comfortably, and the plant will be all right. Cut right round it. Now I reckon to be able to lift a root ball of about two feet comfortably. And it's a good idea, if you're in doubt, to have a sack and to put it round the roots as you lift it out. Give it a good soaking before you move it. Get your spade right underneath it. If it's a big shrub, then you take out a trench like that. Open it right up, because you want to work back into the roots rather than out cutting all that you come to. Then you get in on one knee and really attack it so you cut the roots from underneath. It's not easy work, but that shrub is worth something like six pounds. If you try and put a value on growth, whew. Ah, no, I'll have to be round the behind again. This is where you've got the competition from the roots of the tree behind. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Marvellous. One of the things that can kill shrubs is planting them too deep. You want no deeper than the shrub was originally planted to. Use your hands. Firm it in. Work it in round the fine root. Get, into, get your fingers in the soil. It's a grand sensation. firm as you go on, like that. Tread it down. I tread to within about an inch and a half of the surface. Firm it well. Work the rest of the soil around it to leave a decent finished level. They're like children. You've got to water them and Feed them and give them a pat on the head occasionally. Because if you neglect 
any part. You can neglect them a little bit when you go away on holiday, but neglect them too much, you get exactly out of gardening what you put into it. That'll do for starters. I'll give it some more tonight when it can percolate slowly down. And I'll give it over the foliage too because this plant is being moved just about fortnight, three weeks too early. But as long as I look after it, it'll take no harm. I've got a feeling that that one would be better planted. This was a spare plant in the front garden. It's one of the things you can do when you've got two areas of the garden to develop. You can fill one to overflowing and then use the surplus to bring it out. But that root ball is bare and rhododendrons hate drying out. So I'll plant that one straight away. And there are one thing that doesn't like deep planting and the other point is that this flowers very early in spring in February, which means you're not walking around the garden very much in February, so plant it so you can see it from the most used room in the house. In this case, the room with the French window. If in doubt with rhododendrons, shallow plant and then build them up with feet. And if you look deep in the center of the leaves. There's the promise of next year's flowers. You get the pinky mauve flowers coming in there, masses of them, not just one or two. It's a lovely thing and the flowers will get that little bit of shelter from the taller shrub behind. Lovely. Now that flowers in spring so I want a herbaceous plant in to pick it up that flowers later in the year. I like the salvias. I like the sage as they've got this spicy aroma. When the foliage is moist, when it rains, they have this lovely, rich, herby smell. Grain blue. No, just a little bit more to the left. glorious plants, the lace cap hydrangeas. This one is almost finished. In full sun, you lose the value, the multicoloring of the flowers. So I'm putting it in partial shade, so the light that comes onto it is dappled and it draws all the color of the flowers out. And that'll go into that corner. Gets a little bit of shelter too. Now that again is autumn, so with my spring bulbs, I want something that's going to flower and flower. And there's no shrub does better than that than the potent tiller. The shrubby sanqua foil, this really is a poppet of a plant. It starts to flower in May, and look at it, it's still in flower right at the end of the summer. Now, it's not a very tall growing variety, this one. I want the border to go up, down, and then dramatically up again. So I'm using a potent tiller, which will grow two feet, 30 inches high. Yellow flowers. Now then, problems. Something with foliage. The dark purple leaves of the Berberus, some birdseye, mottled and flecked with white. Now that foliage is there right through the summer and then it deepens and intensifies in the autumn. And this one's called Rose Glow. It truly describes it. When the sun lights on it, the color of this picked up, it becomes luminous. And that will contrast very pleasantly with the color of the portentilla. And the border now is becoming too light. There's not enough body in the foliage plant. So, a hebe. Simon Deleur has rather ponderous leaves. The flowers are delicate. This is a truly beautiful shrub. Now, in some gardens, this isn't quite hardy. It's not a, a shrub that I would grow if my garden was very exposed. But with the shelter of the hedge, I'll get away with it. And you can see the pattern beginning to build up, how the colors 
blend and then contrast and complement each other and how the interest is continuous down the border. The shrubs are the framework that are going to carry the herbaceous plants which of course lose the tops during the, the winter time. And I think Hellenium Crimson Beauty. If you put that colour in shade, it would deaden it. If you put it in sunlight so it catches the evening sunlight, all the richness of the bronze is carried out. So that can go behind there because it's tall enough to carry the flowers above the sedum. The dark red in autumn, the purple of the Hebe in autumn, the potentilla for the spring, the perennial foliage interest of the Berberus. Now, I left some flocks in the border, a white one in this case, so I can thicken that group a little bit. There's a knife off, you're in beside it, and I can afford to let these two mingle. Don't be frightened to mix plants up. What would a Christmas pudding be like if you kept all the ingredients separate? Use them. And that one is scented. White Admiral. A development. I used to grow white, an old-fashioned white, in the cottage garden. This is dwarf, a more compact. It fits into the narrowness of the border. But so many of the flocks are fragrant. And what is a garden without fragrance? What is a garden without bird life and all the rest of it? And because the border is small, you can't afford to have continuous colour themes. So, because this theme started as flocks, put a pink one in, and then behind, to throw all the other colours into really bold relief, a darker coloured one. And there's a little group with geum in front of it and escabious, real cottage garden flowers. And I've noticed I've made a mistake there. I've put a Hebe in. This happens. I don't profess to get things right first time. And when I look at that, the Hebe is too far back. I'm losing the value of that foliage by having the dark hedge behind. So pull it forward a touch. A little bit more. And I've got a delphinium with light flowers. I really do like delphiniums. Graceful, statuesque plants. This one doesn't look too happy because it's getting on in the season, but with a little bit of care and they like being fed. Now that is better. Contrasting shapes, flat shapes, upright shapes, and that'll lift and I'll get the flower colour against the hedge. Now, I've got a lot of red foliages, and I haven't any blue in yet. And I did plan the, the border out on paper. I knew what I wanted, so I bought what I wanted. I wasn't quite sure what permutations they'd look best in. Some plants have so much character, so much beauty, and the balloon flower is one of those. It looks a bit like a campanula, but it has a little more personality. And that's just the right tone of blue. To pick up the colour of the berberus and the colour of the sedum. A little bit further away. Berberus back a little bit. Now then, I think a fuchsia or something that will not grow too tall in that. There's so many fuchsias, Hardy, that I feel it's a pity people don't appreciate them at their full worth. They carry an enormous quantity of flowers. Look at it. And that's just the right light sort of colour tone. I'll pop it there for the time being because I'm not absolutely happy in my mind that that's the right place. And shade isn't something you should grumble about in a garden because there are some plants that almost demand it. And you think out how you're going to utilize first the slightly less dense shade, the deeper shade, and then the very close shade, close to the tree. And the Leucothoia, with the lovely party-colored leaves called rainbow, will maintain that colored foliage. It's evergreen, of course and it will maintain that coloured foliage, provided I don't put it in too dense shade. 
So that goes on the edge. You can see it light up. Immediately it gets the covering. Isn't that beautiful? The combination of yellow flowers and pink berries, the St. John's wort, a hypericum called Elstead. And I feel somehow that these are better in shade. I grew them underneath a laurel hedge in my old home in the Dales. Now, hosters, you get varieties like Thomas Hogg, where the leaf is margined with cream. And that will go against the rather ponderous foliage next to it, and it'll be lightened by it. And with albomarginate, you get the additional bonus of a flower. Beautiful flowers. They're not, yes, just slightly fragrant. Anemones. Plants of childhood, I grew up with a massed border of these. Now there was two anemones left in, one behind, one in front. Now that makes a group. The grey-leaved Santolina, I would always have in a garden. Cotton lavender, that goes in front of the GM, which again were left in. And then you've got the bright orange flowers and you've got a, a hummock of grey foliage in front of them. That should be nice. And because I really do love alpines, no question about it, they have a dignity. You can't change alpines, they're still mountain flowers. And they make good front of the border plants. There, that's it. It's not just a shrub border, it's not just a herbaceous border, it's not even a bulb or a bedding out border. It's a great glorious mixture of garden plants, cottage garden and I love it. It's the best of all. Now the plants are all neatly arranged to my satisfaction, I can actually start putting them into position. And this is one thing that never pauses: the business of handling plants, of putting them in the soil, of putting bulbs in, and then of seeing them grow. And the increase in beauty every year is the satisfaction of a job well done. And as always, make the hole big enough to contain it easily. And remember when you're planting that the hallmark of a good gardener too is once he's got a plant under his hands, he always has it. That's what you want. A root ball like that. I just tease the bottom a bit, just enough to, to bring the roots out, to stop them wrapping round and staying in the ball, to fetch them, not round the edges, but at the bottom. And when I said a good gardener, once he's got a plant, always has it, I take a few pieces off like that, cuttings, pop them round the edge of a four-inch pot in sharp sand, a little bit of hormone on them, and then if this one does happen to die, which heaven forbid it won't, I'll have one or two little ones to help it along. Hands in again, and ram it firm, because that root ball is good and solid. And you want the soil round it good and solid, or the, the water runs, it hits the root ball and runs into the loose soil round it, and your root ball is constantly dry. They were thoroughly soaked before they were put in. You can almost, if you listen, you can hear them sigh with relief. That's where a plant should be, in the soil, in soil well prepared. And if your soil is well prepared, no additional feeding is necessary for a year. They talk about foliar feeding and all the rest of it. If you've done your job right, that's gilding the lily, and no gardener likes to waste money like that. And I don't want to waste that cutting if I can help it, so 
pop it inside the polythene bag and then I can put them in after tea this evening. Probably the most important tree that I'm putting into the border is the cherry. It's expensive. It's going to be a central feature in the garden for many years. It's got to be exactly right. If that fails, then really the rest of the border has lost out. And I still haven't got all that wicken grass, and that's important. As you see it, pick it up. Every time there's a, a little piece of green shows above the ground, pull it out. And that's where you eventually tease it to death. It may seem a waste to cut polythene bags like that, but this is a big plant and I don't want to knock its roots about. Slit it down the back. Oh, that is beautiful. It really is. Take the weeds off the top. Because what the soil, if it's good enough to grow good plants, will grow marvelous weeds as well. Handsome. Very handsome. And I've underestimated the hole. That's a typical example of a half pint hole for a pint plant. So I lift him out. Don't ever compromise. If necessary, lift it out a dozen times. Get it. Deepen it. Good depth of soil. That's still good stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, two spade grass down. Even smells good. Make sure that you've got it lined up in the right place, too. Knock the edges of the hole in. It's best, actually, if you're going to use a spade handle like that to borrow somebody else's, because it doesn't really do it any good. If you're using your own, be a bit gentle with it. But it wants to be firm. You want to be hard in. And you can't take cuttings of cherry tree. Well, not this particular cherry, anyway. They're usually grafted. You can see where the point of graft is. And watch that. If any growths come from below ground level, then they're not the cherry you want. So take them off. Pull them off. Treat the wound with some sort of preservative. Stockholm tar is probably as good as any. Yes, I'd almost, weather permitting, give a guarantee with that one. It already looks nice. The rhododendron, I lifted out of the front garden, I watered it, but I'm going to mulch that when the board is finished. And now for the herbaceous plant. That, of course, will be ready for dividing in about five years' time. So for, it's better than putting money in the bank. I'm going to get five for one. If anybody can give me that sort of return on money, then I'll be delighted to bank with them. They're nicely grown, these. You don't mind paying good money for plants that are in fair condition. And the hands are still the best implement for firming herbaceous plants in. And there I've got the continuity of flower. This will do the business during the summer. And give me a change in shape, too. And the hydrangea, of course. And, and by planting them like this, you get the contrast. I mean, the rather upright habit of the salvia and then suddenly the delicate formation of the hydrangea. I really do like them. And this one's in a pot. And even though it's over the hill, you can still get some idea of the beauty of the plant. 
I'll leave the canes on it because they'll help to support it until it gets established. Ah, there's a crock in here. <laughs> what gardeners call a piece of old pot just to block the drainage hole. Loosen the roots at the bottom because when a plant is as pot bound as this, it tends to stay in there and starve itself to death, which seems a bit ridiculous. That's it, make sure all the air pockets are filled and the soil's leveled off. And here comes the rain, the good old English summer, but just right for planting shrubs. drop of rain's just made all the difference in the world. Now to my real cottage garden favourite. That colour will intensify. One of the things with delphiniums is that you don't really get a true representation of the plant until about the third year. They're not flowering, as we say, in character. So don't be disappointed if they look like a, a slightly underfed larkspur at this stage. They'll make up if your soil's right. And that's one thing anybody can do. Get the soil right. Because all you need is a good spade and a bit of hard work. I've often said the best fertilizer for any garden is sweat. And delphiniums are very easy to propagate. When the young shoots come up in spring, There'll probably be, what, a dozen shoots come out of the ground next spring. I don't want a dozen. I want to thin them down until this plant's established, until there's only three, possibly, or four. And the shoots that I take off with a sharp knife, I can root and make cuttings of. I keep proving I'm a Yorkshireman, but I reckon you never want to give out away until you've got a fair share yourself. I suppose all gardeners find an irresistible urge to make cuttings of everything they grow, but it's one of the fascinating parts of gardening that you can propagate so many things so easily. And in my Yorkshire garden, I found that there was about 16 varieties of fuchsia hardy. So provided you insist on a hardy one, And that's a typical example of how laziness in taking a container off doesn't do you any good at all. I've broken the soil ball because I was too idle to get my knife out of my pocket. All you can do is apologize to the plant, take the broken piece off, make sure you can remember the name, and don't do the same daft trick twice. Step back, have another little look. Take the rubbish up. It's amazing how just a level with the rake transforms it. Santalina, that's a different sort of pot the Santalina's in. It's made of peat. Now, never plant a plant into the garden with a peat pot that's dry. The roots never come through. Never put a plant into the garden whose roots aren't through the bottom of a peat pot. Otherwise, they stay. But you can plant them with the pot and all, and the pot will eventually rot to make food for the plant, which seems a good idea. We're starting to get into the shade area underneath the tree now. And one of the things to remember if you're planting variegated shrubs 
Don't put them in too dense shade. Otherwise, you lose the intensity of the variegation, which is a pity, because that's the whole beauty of the shrub. That is lovely. You've got that all the year round. Glorious in winter when it's rhymed with hoar frost. Entirely different root system, a fibrous root system. Uh, more or less what I call a rhododendron root system, which means that plant, in nine cases out of ten, likes a peaty, oozy soil. Don't put it in too deep. Can be fatal with a very fine root system like that. It's much better to plant it a little less deeply and then build up round it with compost or well-rotted manure or even peat. And the flame of the forest, the whole beauty of this shrub is the tender scarlet young growths in spring. They are tender, they can be cut by a late frost. So the canopy of the tree gives them that little bit of protection. If a plant is new to you, read about it, find out about it. It's no use paying a pound for a shrub like that and then planting it in a limey soil. It doesn't like lime. Far better buy a lilac or another potent tiller that does enjoy a limey soil. That one definitely wants some peat around it. <laughs> Trouble. I've got an awful tendency to linger admiring things. As my family call them, my pondering moments. Dash it all, I've paid good money for them. I want to enjoy them. And if you don't take time out to lean on a gate and look when you're gardening, you're not getting half the pleasure out of it. There is an entirely different root system. Fleshy roots, because the host is normally growing very moist soil. Now, the soil under this tree is very certainly not going to be very moist. They're going to get the shade that they like, so I've got to create the moist conditions by mulching it up with compost or manure and by tipping a bucket of water on it. I wouldn't like a garden that once you'd planted it, it looked after itself. Not for me. That takes the fun out. I like it that, to look after itself a little bit, not to need its nappy changing every third day. But I do like to have to look after individual plants occasionally to coax them along a bit, to get to know them a little better. And somehow the leaves take on an additional interest when you've got a patina of light and shade over them. If that was in full sun, the colour would be the same over the whole leaf, apart from the edge of cream. But immediately you get this play of light and shade from the tree above. There's additional interest. Ah, that's a powerful root system. I bet that one's a good trencherman. Doesn't need to pull its chair up the table either. Taller at the back. And now, because the hosters are growing underneath the tree, they're in fairly dry conditions, I'm going to use some well-rotted compost. Beautiful stuff, that. Almost gone back to soil again, but it's rich in humus. The moisture-holding potential of that is about 20 times its own weight. around the plant, and it gradually breaks down and improves the soil as well. And any gardener who takes a garden and has it for a year 
and can't walk out and say, well, the soil's better than when I started. Well, he isn't really a gardener. He's not worth knowing. The shrubs that were in containers, of course, won't need a mulch until spring. But the ones that I dug up and moved from one part of the garden to another, I'm going to do them now. I've just got enough left to do it. And then the last piece of what I call titivation to put the clematis onto the tree. Now, there's one thing that I noticed about this clematis when I bought it in the nursery with the other shrubs. That root ball must be as dry as snuff because the soil is built up so high it's impossible to get any water in there. The only way to make certain that that is thoroughly moist from top to bottom, dunk it in a bucket of water. Step it off from the tree a little bit. Straight down there, it'll be bone dry, so I can hear it sucking water up. That's the beauty of oak trees. You couldn't do that with a silver birch or, or with an ash tree. You see, there's no surface roots. And the host won't mind if I take just a little bit of the compost. And with clematis, if you keep them mulched every year with a mixture of bone meal and compost. Once it's stopped bubbling, it means the root ball is thoroughly saturated. I can actually plant that with the pot still on it if I was really determined because the roots are right through the side. So I think I'll do that. I'm going to do more harm taking that pot off and it isn't really necessary. Leave the cane in like that. I'll put a tie around it and this is a Clematis Montana Rubens. Vigorous, it'll go up this tree along that branch. It'll hang down in a pink, very sweetly scented curtain. I hope. You can't guarantee anything in gardening, except I'll guarantee next spring's going to come. And that at least some of the things that I've planted are going to come up. And all that remains to be done is to water the plants in. But remember, if you're planting in late evening and there's a threat of cold weather, forget the watering till next morning. Get up early and do it before the sun's on the foliage. And I've left spaces between the shrubs because it's there I'll be planting up my spring flowering bulbs like the daffodils, like the crocus and my own favourite snowdrops. And this way with the shrubs and herbaceous plants I'll have a colourful garden all the year round. This has to be the best part of the day. The job's finished. I'm pleasantly tired comfortably relaxed and I've got the satisfaction of having seen a garden grow under my hands. That's the beauty of making a border of this sort. You look back at the end of the day and you can see exactly what you've done and you can take an immense satisfaction in it. I only <laughs> hope my friend who owns the border gets as much pleasure out of watching it grow in because it's going to take years. It's not just a thing of a moment. The shrubs have got to mature. It's beautiful now. It'll be incredibly beautiful, I hope, in five years' time. Well, that's the end of the flower garden video, Graham, but do look out for others in the series, especially the one on vegetables. There's some very useful tips in that as well.